but I'm very excited to hear us talk. Without further ado, um, take it away. Cool. Um, that sounds good. And I guess before I jump into the talk, um, Kyle, how should we handle questions for this? I guess uh, should we do uh, just have people submit it over a chat and then like answer them at the end, or kind of what's the what's the conventional way of handling questions? Um, really, it's up to your preference. Do you prefer if people interrupt you uh, in between, or is that okay? Or do you want people to just kind of hold off until until regular checkpoints through the talk? I think I would prefer. I think I would prefer if maybe if there's like clarification questions throughout, then um, I would be happy to take them. Otherwise, other questions I think might make sense to go at the end because cool. there's a few projects that I'd like to talk about, and I think it might make sense to kind of sort out the questions afterwards. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, um, it's great to see everyone again, and uh, I, I'm really pleased that everybody. Uh, is is here to see this talk today. Um, as you as you may know, I was at AI2 as an intern a little while ago, and we've been undertaking the the collaboration on the ScholarFi project uh, for for I guess about a year and a half now. Um, so it's a delight that everybody decided that they wanted to see yet another reprise of this project, and and I'm also excited to say I'll have some other things that I can share too about some other authoring and reading related tools that I've developed that I think might make some for some really interesting food for thought as we think about future tools that we can build together. So where I want to start is by asking you to think about the last time that you wanted to share a technical idea with someone else in a written medium. This might have been the last time that you wrote, for instance, a scientific paper, where throughout the process of writing this paper, you likely made hundreds of small decisions that were reified in thousands of these small interaction events. So let us say that you were writing this machine learning paper in your Overleaf editor. Throughout the process, you might have decided, it's time for me to consolidate some of this exploratory draft material into a more clear and concise telling of my story. Or you might have thought, I really want to change this concept here or this piece of data. But I also have to then change the related content in the dozens of other related passages within the paper. Or you might have asked the question, will readers understand the mathematical formalisms that I put in this paper, the notation and equations that I'm using to formalize some of the ideas in this paper? And if this isn't something that you've experienced as an author, it's something that you might have experienced as a reader trying to understand notation in other people's writing. And in fact, notation, exploratory messes, and tangled interrelated content are these three types of issues that commonly manifest in complex information artifacts of all types, whether they are scientific papers, computational notebooks that are used by data analysts, programming tutorials, or any number of different types of written artifacts across the literature. And it's been shown that these artifacts are used not only by millions of people, but furthermore, that messiness and complexity pervades throughout them. How can we help readers and authors interact with these complex information artifacts? Well. I have a background in building out interactive programming systems. And from this background, I think about the metaphor of the IDE, the Integrated Development Environment. IDEs are these advanced writing and, uh, writing and reading tools for computer programs. And they're feature rich, providing these advanced affordances for authoring and reading. And they can help people deal with these different sources of complexity. For instance, they can provide context relevant explanations of notation, like variables and functions by showing tooltips of what they mean overlaid on top of them within the editor. They can also assist in the cleaning process of removing some of this exploratory messes by, for instance, highlighting code that is no longer necessary for the program to run correctly, which is a prime target for someone to remove. They can also support making cross-document edits of tangled interrelated content. For instance, I can change a variable name in one place and then propagate that change across hundreds of other places and dozens of other files. And the reason that we have these great tools for reading and writing code is because there have been decades of experience of carefully designing these interactions for programming environments, as well as building out the requisite artifact analyses on the code that enables those interactions. Could we have IDEs for ideas? Essentially, these IDEs that support people in reading and writing other types of complex information artifacts that extend existing interactive reading and writing interfaces um, and provide these interactions grounded in dedicated analysis algorithms of those artifacts. This is the main area of my research, building out these IDEs for ideas and constituent in them 
the three components of them, of context relevant explanations of notation, assisted cleaning of messes, and cross document edits of tangled interrelated content. And over the course of this talk, you'll see me talk about three of these IDEs for ideas. One of them, which many of you are likely familiar with, is the ScholarFi project, which helps explain complex notation. For instance, with ScholarFi, I, as a reader, can click on an equation, and then I can see an automatically laid out equation diagram with definitions of each of those symbols aligned on the boundaries of that equation. Uh, here's a tool uh, which assists in the cleaning process in computational notebooks for data analysts, where a data, an an analyst, a, a data analyst who wants to share some of, the, uh, some of their data analysis process with someone else can select on a result within their computational notebook, and then they can click on gather to notebook in order to pull out a cleaned up account of their data analysis that's capable of reproducing just that result with all of the code recovered and put in order. Another project embodies cross document edits in the space of programming tutorials, wherein one of these programming tutorials uh, that, that someone is authoring ends up becoming a live document where as someone changes some of the snippets, those edits propagate across snippets. And furthermore, there's this propagation of edits across heterogeneous types of content, where as I change one of these snippets, the outputs that depend on it also update live. My main research area has been thus to flesh out these three different types of tools in the IDEs for Ideas Toolkit, for these three different types of information artifacts of tutorials, computational notebooks, and scientific papers. Ultimately leading to these five projects that you can see, which have been published and often gotten awards in major HCI publications over the course of the last five years or so. I focus on these three types of information artifacts in particular because not only are they widely used, but they also contain sufficient formalisms within them that support analyses from which you can make new interactions for reading and authoring. Furthermore, by exploring all of these different types of interfaces in parallel, I continually see that certain interactions and implementation patterns end up transferring across these different domains and giving rise to these new ideas that we might not have anticipated initially. In this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on the ScholarFi and Gather project because of the areas for potential resonance with AI2, both with interactive reading, as well as tools that support the data analysis and machine learning process. A few meta-level comments about this research is, First of all, the types of contributions that come about from my research are, first of all, providing missing knowledge about how to build these systems in terms of the tasks of explaining, cleaning, and editing, and how they manifest for each of these artifacts. The required analyses of the artifacts of, in terms of program analyses and text analyses that end up powering new interactions. And then the interactive systems themselves that provide access to powerful reading and authoring interactions. My methods are those from technical HCI, where most of my projects begin with formative studies with users to elicit needs around these systems, iteratively developing these systems through the design process and building out working backends through a variety of different technical methods, ultimately leading to the evaluation of these systems in both lab settings as well as other settings as well. The technical methods that I draw on come from program analysis, software engineering, and increasingly natural language processing techniques as necessary in order to bring about these visions of how we can provide these IDEs for ideas. In the rest of this talk then, I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so talking about three IDEs for ideas uh, across these different types of information artifacts to give you a sense of what these tools and the toolkits look like in, in high resolution, as well as how to build working systems that enable these interactions, ultimately leading up to a research agenda of interesting research questions that I would like to pursue, uh, potentially as a young investigator on the Semantic Scholar research team. My forays into designing context-relevant explanations actually did not begin in scholarly documents, but rather in programming tutorials, like the one that you can see here. The reason that we began in programming tutorials is that we observed that when a programmer is reading how to program using one of these tutorials, oftentimes they come upon complex notation, like this Unix command that you can see right here, where it's very cryptic. It's hard to get a sense of what it means from just looking at the code alone, particularly if you haven't seen this command before. And so what I wondered is, would it be possible to automatically detect these on the fly when they appear in programming tutorials? And then when someone selects it, you can make an explanation of it available on the fly which includes both these high-level descriptions of what the code does, as well as these low-level descriptions of each of the tokens 
within those Unix commands so that someone both has a high level understanding of it and the ability to modify its low level parts. I didn't stop here. I also developed these explainers that were capable of detecting CSS selectors within pages and then generating types of content such as natural language uh, explanations of what that CSS selector might select on a web page. For instance, the selector chooses buttons from elements of class content container seven. The way that these are generated is by producing a parse tree of that CSS selector and then slowly bit by bit building up a natural language explanation of it when visiting each of the nodes in that parse tree, combining it together into a complete sentence. Another type of explanation is an example of what that CSS selector will match on an HTML web page. And using a similar technique of parsing the CSS selector and visiting each of the nodes within it, you can build up an example of these HTML fragments that it will match. And through the process of building these explainers in the domain of programming tutorials, I ended up finding out that they could help people understand these tutorials. In fact, in an in-lab usability study of these explainers, which we called tutorons for little bits of tutorials, we ended up finding out that readers were capable of accessing significantly less external documentation when modifying these uh, CSS selectors and Unix commands within the tutorials in order to appropriate them for new tasks. Having seen this pattern work in the space of programming tutorials, fast forward a few years later, we started to ask, could this also work in one of these other notation dense documents that we frequently read, which is a scientific paper? In fact, this is a project that we've, we started undertaking in partnership with the Allen Institute for AI, where as someone is reading a scientific paper, whether it's something from the biosciences, uh, from medicine, from computer science, from physics, or even the social sciences, notation often abounds, um, as, as well as cryptic terminology in the form of acronyms that might be abbreviations for uh, results uh, and uh, different metrics that are used and, and approaches and algorithms in the form of mathematical symbols, as well as new terms that are introduced to embody new concepts that, that have come about throughout, the, th throughout this paper. And within a single paper, there might be hundreds of appearances of these acronym symbols and new terms. You can imagine that a straightforward interaction to provide to someone in order to help them understand the meaning of these terms and symbols is to simply provide this tutorons-like explanation where someone can just select a symbol within a paper, for instance, and then see an explanation of it like self-attended token representation for token T at layer J. How can we build out a tool that both provides satisfying explanations to people in a way that doesn't distract from the reading task, as well as is capable of doing so accurately? And one would think that it would be possible to build out a system like this. In fact, um, I can tell you from my experience collaborating with uh, postdoctoral researcher Dong Yop Kong at UC Berkeley, who's been working on some of the NLP behind this project, that um, you can use automated definition detection techniques these days on some of these papers, where you can envision, for instance, taking in sentences as input and then producing terms and definitions that were found in those sentences as output. You can do this by applying a conditional random field in order to do sequence tagging on each of the tokens within that sentence. And you can improve the performance of this uh, sequence tagger by, uh, by using a state-of-the-art transformer encoders such as Cyber, applying it to inputs with feature extraction such as parts of speech, noun phrase, and, um, and um, the identity of each of the tokens in terms of are they noun phrases, verb phrases, entities, and applying some heuristic rules afterwards. These techniques to date are getting better and better each year. Right now, you can achieve around 73% F1 score on a definition sequence tagging task. And so my question as a human computer interaction researcher is, assuming we can eventually achieve perfect output or near perfect output with these algorithms, what is the right output in the experience for the users? The design problem in this case is, of course, that say someone wants to understand this letter with the, with the symbol H means within this passage from this machine learning paper. It's defined on this other page as attention head. And its meaning is also implied by these many different places that H is used throughout the passage. A question that I'll leave for you is, how should a reader request information about the symbol H? And once they've clicked on it, what information about H should they be shown? I'll give you 15 seconds to think up your own answer to this question. And then I'll walk you through a play-by-play -play of our own design thoughts.
So now that you've had a chance to think through what an effective explanation would look like in C2 for this letter H, you may have had a chance to recognize some of the challenges in the design problem. One of these challenges is that the passages in which notation appears are often very dense. So there might not just be one symbol or one term, but many of them, and a lot of re relevant context across the rest of the passage. Any explanations that should be shown in place shouldn't occlude too much of the surrounding text, lest it actually get in the way of someone assimilating an understanding from the surrounding text. Furthermore, symbols are often understood in context rather than on their own. For instance, a reader's task might be to understand this entire equation rather than just one symbol within it. Symbols are also compositional. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, one question for you is, how many symbols are in this equation here? There are at least 12. At the lowest level on the left-hand side, you have the M, the H, and the J. At the next level up, you have the M sub H to the J. Explanations need to be provided at each of the levels of hierarchy within this notation. One other challenge is that symbols might have multiple meanings. So for this letter T that also appears in the same passage, it's used in one of the paragraphs to mean the number of token representations, and it's also meant used to mean a matrix transposition operator elsewhere within the text. Explanations that are shown should be cognizant of the fact there might be many of these many many different explanations of the same uh, of the same symbol within the same paper and make this information appropriately uh, ex expose this information appropriately to a user. These these design challenges were things that ended up becoming elucidated for us over the course of a year long design process, wherein we conducted five formative user studies, including observations, interviews, focus groups, and observations with early versions of the tools with 35 readers. This ended up leading us to a set of seven design motivations for tools that expose in situ context relevant explanations of terms and symbols. And altogether, once we had these requirements in hand, things like tailoring definitions to the location of the appearance, consolidating information and providing scent, this ended up leading us to the design of what we call the current Scholarify tool. Here's what the Scholarify tool looks like, and here's how it exposes information about symbols and terms. The first feature within a Scholarify is that it allows precise selection of symbols and the subsymbols that they're made up of. So, for instance, in order to get into this, get to the definition of H, one first clicks on the parent symbol of A sub H to the J, and then they click again on the H at each point, seeing the definition at each of those levels of hierarchy. When a symbol is selected, a definition tooltip is shown. And the definition within this tooltip is position sensitive. So if that symbol has been defined in multiple places throughout the paper, the most recent one is shown within that definition tooltip. There's a hyperlink back to the definition in context, and also buttons that can be used to open up lists of all definitions, all formulas that define that symbol, and all usages of that symbol across the paper. When someone clicks on the hyperlink to that definition in context, they're then brought to the passage that defines it within the paper, with a back button that allows them to hop back to the original location where they requested that definition. When a reader seeks to understand an entire equation at once, they can click on that equation in order to see something that's kind of reminiscent of what you might see on a whiteboard in a calculus classroom, an equation diagram, when there are callouts from each of the symbols within that equation to labels that define each of them. And these symbols are once again defined at multiple levels of the hierarchy. If a reader seeks to understand all there is to know about a symbol within a paper, they're provided with this feature that we call declutter, where they can select a symbol, and then all of the passages that contain that symbol are highlighted, and all of the remaining passages within the paper are low-lighted, making them less visually salient. So then the reader can scroll through the rest of the paper in order to find all of the passages that lend additional meaning to what this notation means. Across this set of features, the main interaction design theme is to consolidate all of the information that someone might need in order to understand terms and symbols without occluding the text and getting in the way of the reading task. We evaluated the design of Scholarify in a usability study, wherein 27 researchers participated over Zoom in a study where they both answered questions about a machine learning paper that required an understanding of the notation with and without Scholarify. And then they also undertook a 20 minute focused reading experience where we wanted to see how they would use the features when they were not required, to, uh, when, when they were not, uh, 
when they were not necessarily explicitly related to a goal that they were provided with. And what we ended up observing is that ScholarFi measurably improved scholars' ability to answer questions about the paper that required an understanding of the notation. For instance, researchers answered questions about the paper in significantly less time while viewing significantly less of the paper and traveling significantly less distance, according to some metrics that we uh, collected from an instrumented version of the ScholarFi interface. Um, in, in accordance with their subjective measures, they reported significantly higher ease and confidence in answering these questions when ScholarFi was available versus a baseline reader. Furthermore, when scho scholars had access to ScholarFi, uh, during their focused reading time, they frequently made use of the definition tooltips and equation diagrams. When we asked them which of these features they would expect to use most frequently in their, in their future tools, all readers anticipated that they would use definition tooltips and equation diagrams either often or always if they were available in their reading tools. We also started to see some emergent behaviors of how someone might interact with these tools once they were available uh, within their reading interfaces. For instance, readers were checking on their understanding by using the tooltips, rather than just informing themselves of the meaning of the symbols up front. We even saw an example of a reader who was reading a section by jumping from one equation diagram to the next, while skipping over the intervening text. The excitement around this project that we, that we got from, from researchers within this project was enough to galvanize us with AI2 to work towards a semantic reader beta. And in fact, um, just as of yesterday, you can go to semanticscholar.org slash product slash semantic reader in order to see our beta page for the semantic reader project, where we're bringing some of these affordances, uh, particularly to date declutter, and we're hoping some of the definition related affordances in the near future, as well as some others around exploring and understanding citations uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to an interface that we hope to make available for a large portion of archive papers and perhaps even generally PDFs on, on, on Semantic Scholar in the future. So one part of this project is building out interesting interactions that can support the reading experience. And the other part of this research project is building out a working backend that can actually make it work. Within the ScholarFi project, the UI is all completely functional in terms of the cross-link navigation, the highlighting and low lighting, and the automatic layout of these diagrams. Definition detection is a, a part of the, this project that we're actively working on alongside the postdoctoral scholar Dong Yup Kong that I talked about earlier. Um, and we're achieving strides in accuracy um, each month. There's this other part of the project that I've worked closely on, which is symbol detection and localization, which I want to talk briefly about to give you a sense of some of the technical depth behind these projects. How do we accurately detect symbols and sub-symbols within, within, a, within a PDF? Let's just restrict ourselves to PDFs that have been produced from LaTeX-based documents. One way that you can find the location of symbols is, let's just talk about the task of first finding an equation. Um, when, you render it, when, you, when you render an equation from LaTeX to a PDF, here's, a, here's an example of a rastered version of that PDF where you can see that equation appearing. If you parse that, if you parse the paper that that equation came from, you can look for equations that might appear between dollar signs, and then you can surround them in a coloring command, such that if you were to re-render that PDF, that equation would appear in a visually salient color. You can then difference the two copies of the PDF that you've produced, the uncolorized version and the colorized version, in order to get a colorized, uh, in order to get just colorized pixels corresponding to that equation. You can do this for many different colors for many different equations to detect them in parallel. And then you can, you can produ uh, produce a custom bounding box, horizontal bounding box detector in order to find precise positions of that equation. Why would someone use this approach rather than, for instance, instrumenting a LaTeX compiler in order to report the positions of each of the equations? Well, one of the reasons behind this is that there are many different LaTeX compilers in use, and most of them are based on code that was written by Don Knuth in 1983. So the instrumentation problem then becomes not only reverse engineering a pretty ancient project, but also doing this for many different variants of that ancient project. At the same time, the above approach that I just described, while it's imperfect, it's capable of port uh, it's, it's portable across different LaTeX compilers and relatively straightforward to implement. Once you have the equations, you can then find the positions of each of the symbols within the equation by, for instance, taking the LaTeX for that equation, passing it through a parser, which then uh, 
comes up with a structured representation of that equation and all of the letters within that equation and how they relate to each other. Each of those, um, that, that parse can then lead to precise character positions of each of the tokens within that equation. With those character positions of those tokens, you can then apply colors to each of the tokens within the equation. Bounding boxes can be found for each of those tokens using the approach that I just described for equations. And then using the structural information from the parse tree and these uh, individual bounding boxes of tokens, you can then coalesce together those bounding boxes into bounding boxes for symbols at each of the levels within the hierarchy. This approach on a development set of machine learning papers has been observed to get a precision of around 96% and a recall of around 88%. So altogether, you should be starting to get a sense of how I go about pursuing one of these uh, projects in interactive reading in terms of simultaneously trying to understand needs, the interactions that can satisfy them, and building out the interactive, the uh, implementing the interactive systems that can actually enable those interactions. So now that we've talked about augmenting the reading experience, let's talk about how one could augment the authoring experience. And we'll start. Andrew, oh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt just before you go on. Can you talk a little bit more about the 88% uh, recall, just so we have a flavor of, you know, it seems so elegant. I know LaTeX, of course, isn't, but it just seems so elegant that I was hoping for 100% recall. I'm sure so were you. <laughs> yeah, so was I. Um, so uh, there, there's a couple of sources of that 88%. So one of those is that one of the sources of the 88% is that uh, this is before we resolve macros within these papers. So um, some authors uh, often use macros uh, for, for some of the symbols that appear within their equations. And, uh, and in those cases, we actually cannot detect uh, the, the symbols that are represented by those macros. And so that accounts for about a three or 4% hit. There's also a number of other cases where we found out that just wholesale, some equations were not found within, uh, within these papers for reasons that I think essentially amount to when you try to insert these coloring commands at certain, at kind of arbitrary places within the LaTeX documents, sometimes uh, the LaTeX doesn't like it and ends up leading to a compilation failure. So th that is a place where additional engineering effort is needed in order to find uh, some, some of the frequent causes of those compilation errors to, to raise that recall rate. I also, I, I, I also have hopes that some alternative symbol detection techniques will also further improve the recall, which, which I'll talk a bit about the future work in, 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 in 15 minutes or so. Right, but the reason that I'm asking other than kind of just curiosity is it seems like there's a really fundamental question here, which is, right, because the precision is so high, if you could drive the recall close to 100%, then this would be a really, uh, this would be the way to do it. If on the other hand, there's something insurmountable or just too hairy here, it's a different story. The engineering issues, you were kind of saying a little bit more engineering would clear up, the macro issues, I mean, ultimately it's a compiler, right? Why can't you, um, you know, follow the macros, you know, expand the macros. What, what, what am I, what am I missing? <laughs> so um, there's, there are several reasons why one might believe that this is not necessarily the end point for how someone would want to detect these symbols. Um, one of the, so, you know, I think as for the macros, we've, we've been experimenting with some uh, approaches to expand the macros, and they've been pretty promising to, uh, to, to date. Um, and, and I'd be happy to talk some more about those at, at, some, at some later point. Um, the, the macro expansions that we've done so far has basically involved in dynamically instrumenting another LaTeX compiler that runs over the paper and tries to find the expansions and then perform them on the paper. One of the issues that, that does arise is that um, as you add these coloring commands, they also introduce sometimes these subtle visual shifts in the layout of the text. And so what that means is that um, in order to make sure that we're not shifting the positions of symbols, we end up colorizing them and detecting them in relatively small batches of around 30 symbols at a time or so which requires many, many tech compilations. So all of this to say, um, I'm simultaneously working on trying to do some vision-based uh, symbol detection. Uh, it's actually a project that I'm working on uh, right now, and I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit of the intuition about that going forward. But I would say that, um, you know, I think macro expansion is something that I have, 
I'm pretty confident that we can get a handle on. The runtime is something that I think that we might need smarter approaches um, that, that, that go beyond just this kind of brute force, several LaTeX compilations approach. Thank you. OK, so um, now that we've talked about augmented reading experiences, let's talk about an augmented authoring experience, particularly a tool that can assist in the cleaning process. And what I want to focus on is a tool for data analysts. This is a project that I undertook with Microsoft Research, where it's a tool to help people manage messes that arise in the computational notebooks that they write, where computational notebooks are this medium that data analysts frequently use in order to write data analysis code. Messes frequently arise within these computational notebooks. And I can show you a vignette as to how that happens. In a computational notebook, someone writes code, a few lines of code at a time, and incrementally executes it by submitting this code in these cells, one cell at a time, to an interpreter. As they incrementally execute this code, they can also embed in situ outputs within their computational notebook. For instance, visualizations that show summary statistics of their data, uh, or charts that might plot some of the features. Messes start to arise as someone makes incremental changes to the code in their computational notebook. For instance, changing some of the parameters of the analysis. Or maybe at a later stage, going back and changing some of the ways by which they clean the data. As they do this, some of the results that appear in some places in the computational notebook no longer reflect the code that is elsewhere within that notebook. Finally, these computational notebooks provide fine-grained control over layout to the extent where the order in which the code appears is not necessarily the order in which it was executed. The challenge for data analysts arises when they want to share an account, uh, an account with, with another data analysis, an analyst or extend their an analysis at a later time, and they just want to know how they can share this result in account of how they arrived at it, where there's insufficient information uh, visible within that computational notebook in order to answer this question. So I designed an assisted cleaning tool within a computational notebook, where at its simplest, it provides an assisted cleaning technique that just takes two clicks from an interaction standpoint. An analyst selects a result of interest from their computational notebook, and then they click on Gather to Notebook. This ends up pulling out a cleaned up version of the computational notebook with the gathered code, where the gathered code is reduced, ordered, and complete. And if one were to rerun it, they would be capable of reproducing the same results. And once you have a basic interaction like this, this gathering interaction can plug into aiding in the, the data, data science exploration process as well, where if an analyst wonders, how did I produce the last variant of this result that I can no longer see? They can, once again, select that result, and in this case, select Gather to Revisions. What then appears is a version browser, where you can see each of the different versions of the result that was produced with a timestamp at which it was produced at the top of these essentially generated mini notebooks. The code leading up to each of these, uh, to, to each of these outputs is that gathered code, that reduced ordered subset of code that was used to produce each of the different versions of that output. Between each of the versions of this cell, you can see these cell-by-cell -cell differences that showed how the analysis changed over time. Once again, as with the ScholarFi project, part of this project was around designing the interactions of, of gathering. And the other part of it was designing the system that could support it, where one of the key parts around gather was to understand how to represent the exploration history in a way that would support dependency analysis on that exploration history, and then provide for generating cleaned versions of that content within the computational notebook. From my background building programming systems, I knew of a technique called program slicing, where program slicing is the technique of taking a program, splitting it into a series of statements, determining the data dependencies, that is cases where uh, a piece of data used on one line depends on that defi the definition or modification of that data on an earlier line, as well as control dependencies, where the execution of one line depends on a decision that is made on another line. Program slicing is widely used in program, uh, program analysis research, and one might be able to imagine that you could use this in order to detect connections between the interrelated pieces of content within a computational notebook. 
The challenge for computational notebooks, though, is that some of the cells in code is missing, and some of the cells are out of order, meaning that you can't apply program slicing to it off the bat. The trick in this case is that instead of slicing a computational notebook, you slice an execution log. And that is what we did. You take the execution log, which is the log of all cells that have been, uh, that have been submitted to the interpreter in order. You align that to the original computational notebook such that when someone selects a chart or a piece of code within the computational notebook, it then becomes a slicing criterion for a backward slice in the execution log. The code that is found within this backward slice in the execution log can then be formatted into these cleaned and ordered notebooks and also shown in these different uh, listings of, of, of version results in the version browser. Of course, it's not entirely that simple. Those of you who have implemented a program dependency analysis, uh, a program analyzer in the past, know that there are all kinds of corner cases that arise as you try to apply them in a particular setting. For instance, you can, um, you can imagine the trickiness around asking the question of, will the following method modify the variable model, model.fit x comma y? Those of us who have fit models in, uh, in a language like scikit-learn will identify the fact that model.fit is probably setting the weights on the model object. Uh, but how do you detect this from just looking at the code alone? Well, some of the techniques that would have worked uh, in, in kind of conventional program analyses were, were not really on the table in our case, where we wanted to develop a browser-based slicer that did not have access to, to the network. Um, and because of this, it wouldn't be able to look up the source code for the model library or instrument the kernel in order to find fine-grained uh, data dependencies for each of the operations that were getting performed. Our solution in this case was to develop a symbol table for the most common data analysis libraries that modeled this fine-grained uh, data dependency behavior and make conservative approximations about data dependencies otherwise. This, among other decisions, can be seen encoded in our open source Python program analysis library, which is hosted on GitHub. To understand how this assisted cleaning tool could support data analysts and computational notebooks, I designed a usability study wherein 12 data analysts both cleaned notebooks as well as undertook exploratory data analysis with Gather available. What I observed was that the, the Gather algorithm closely mapped to the way that many of these analysts envisioned cleaning, where they often described it as picking a subset of cells out of the notebook and removing the rats. They also described many additional stages that seem like prime material for building future IDEs for ideas, such as the tasks of writing documentation, restructuring code, and polishing up visualizations. Furthermore, we saw that these cleaning aids plugged back in to the exploration process within the computational notebook, where analysts were using Gather as a finishing move in order to clean up their, uh, uh, clean up their content, sometimes even gathering multiple slices of their code for multiple different audiences. For instance, visuals for their managers and more code for their collaborators. They also used Gather for lightweight branching of their notebooks, as well as creating personal reference material for themselves. Gather has since been made into a plugin that is now available within the VS Code editor. Here you can see a, YouTube, a YouTuber who is excitingly demonstrating how to use Gather in order to gather the code required to generate the cell into a new notebook. This project required coordination between uh, not only, uh, but between both uh, HCI teams as well as product teams at, at, uh, at Microsoft. And for those of you who are interested in, in how this code works and how the, how the user interface was implemented, you can also check out our open source reference implementation of it on GitHub. One can also think about cleaning experiences that are perhaps more complex and fully featured, things that require more than just a single interaction of a couple of steps, but provide additional control to users. For instance, one project that I've advised on has envisioned cleaning as this flossing interaction that someone might want to do a little bit of all the time in order to pull away little bits of additional uh, superfluous information into this stash, uh, rather than removing it wholesale at the end of an analysis. I also advised a project by Konal Chaudhari, who was a master's student who explored how can you help people look over these slices of results and use program analysis to group together the many results that might appear within one of these computational notebooks and ultimately restore the code for any one of them. You can also envision tools that are kind of conversational between a person and a program analyzer. In fact, one of my tools called CodeScoop focused on helping programmers turn 
complex monolithic programs into concise self-contained snippets of code reminiscent of what might be shared on Stack Overflow. While I won't do a deep dive on this project, I want to share a little bit of my vision of what this kind of conversational workflow looks like between a person and a program analyzer. Where the two aspects of incremental cleaning are, first of all, supporting fine-grained selection. So um, here you can see in CodeScoop, um, the interaction starts out the same way with Gather in that someone selects code of interest and then clicks a button. In this case, a code example, a, a, code, a work in progress code example that you're going to flesh out appears in the right pane of their editor. And then they work together with the tool in order to flesh out that code example. In this case, performing fine grained selections, for instance, in cases where there are ambiguous dependencies, surfacing them to the user, where the user can choose which ones to include and which ones they don't want to include. The tool can also support, for instance, in place simplifications of complex material. For instance, removing a variable and all of its dependencies by instead replacing it with a value that it took on during program execution. For instance, the actual column index for column index title and the actual query instead of the variable and the other places within the code that it would have been computed. In other words, a programmer works together in this iterative loop with a program analyzer as they select code, add in forgotten lines, simplify the code, and make automated fixes in tandem with a static data flow analyzer, an execution trace that provides for these expression simplifications, symbol resolution that, that allows for automatic fixing of imports, and parse tree walkers that essentially uh, detect where each of these entities appear within the code and make them interactive by providing these clickable overlays. I want to seed one last idea of an interactive tool. Uh, which is a tool for cross-document editing that I've worked on, which is another tool that supports authors. The setting in which I've explored cross-document edits is programming tutorials. And the reason I focus on programming tutorials is because they have a lot of interrelated content in them of a heterogeneous nature, including written instructions, code snippets that someone brings all together into a working programming system, as well as listings of expected results of what the code should do at each of the different checkpoints as someone is putting together that program. For instance, here you can see a fully functional version of the Super Mario World game embedded within this programming tutorial. As I conducted formative studies with authors of these programming tutorials, I ended up discovering that there was this major maintenance mess and that whenever someone wanted to go back and change something fundamental in one of the early snippets, they would then have to go back and change many of the other snippets and all of the other outputs that depended on it elsewhere within the tutorial. So the tool that I built was called Tori, and it's a different type of notebook, notebook style program editor where in the left-hand side, you have a source program that someone is trying to teach someone how to build. In the right-hand side, you have a programming tutorial that shows someone how to build up that program over time. And then there's a few main features that support these cross-cutting edits. The first is that there are these linked edits between the snippets of code. So as someone makes a change, for instance, changing the variable name from age to height, it will change in all of the snippets simultaneously. There's also a propagation of edits between the snippets and the original source program. So if someone wants to hang on to that source program so that they can share it as a reference program for someone else or store it in their GitHub repository, as they make changes to that code, it will also change in the tutorial and vice versa. Furthermore, there are links between these heterogeneous types of content. So if someone changes uh, some of the snippets, the outputs are also going to update live. And the outputs infer how all of the snippets should be stacked together above it in order to re-execute the code and reproduce those outputs. So as I look forward to the future of research that I want to conduct, a lot of it falls under what I call building out this IDEs for ideas toolkit of understanding how we can support readers and authors with better context relevant explanations, assisted cleaning tools, and cross-document edits. To date, I've explored this in, in the projects that you've seen within this presentation, and some of the natural places to proceed are in the blank places within this space. And I wanna focus specifically on this column of scientific papers, which is the place where I would envision I would be doing most of my work during my time with Semantic Scholar. There are several directions that I'm already working on today or I'm excited to work on um, that, that, that I would like to share. So one of these is something that arose from this conversation that, that Oren started, which is, 
helping bring some of these technologies from paper to a more widely deployed product, where one of these challenges is, for instance, uh, bringing about more scalable techniques for symbol extraction. Whereas I mentioned, it, recall this passage. One of the challenges to detecting symbols within this passage is that it might require hundreds of compilations of tech due to, uh, due to the way that we currently colorize these symbols in batches in order to reduce the shifts in text that are introduced when the symbols are colorized using LaTeX instrumentation. An alternative technique that I've been prototyping has been to take an initial a pass in order to find all of the symbols within the paper and the LaTeX for each of them. So for instance, you can imagine extracting the LaTeX for this letter T, dollar sign T, dollar sign, rendering it into these image templates that are entirely pixel based, and then performing the search using just a pixel based search for every place that you find that pattern within the paper. What this now means is that if all of the symbols are detected in this pre-processing step and then rendered into these templates first, it will just require one LaTeX compilation, followed by what will be many much faster pixel-based searches. This is something that I've developed an initial prototype of and I'm currently evaluating. And I would see this as one of the first things that I wrap up working on um, if I were to be at Semantic Scholar. I also see there as being all of these interesting questions around personalizing the reading experience, both in terms of the interactions and the systems that can support personalized reading, where I see there as being three fundamental challenges to personalizing the reading experience. The first is determining what should be explained within one of these papers. Some readers may be very familiar with deep learning concepts used within a paper. Some other readers may be very familiar with computational linguistics related concepts, but many readers might be familiar with just some of these domains and not others. How do we model users and their lexical understanding in order to surface explanations just where they need them? A second challenge is deciding how to explain what should be explained. So for instance, a term like softmax function could be explained with a more conceptual description, like this is a function that just maps from this real number scale to, uh, to, uh, to, to an interval from zero to one. Or maybe some readers would really care to see a more formal definition with, with an equation embodying what that softmax function is. In this case, we'd need to model what it is that a user is looking for and what would be an appropriate explanation to show them in each of those cases. A third challenge is to link to external explanations, where one could imagine that if someone really wants to get a good primer on some of their con con uh, conceptual material, they might want, for instance, to be directed to a blog post that introduces attention or to a foundational paper from the field. Once again, the appropriate uh, resources that one would want to recommend depend not only on the resources that are available, but also the background of the reader. A yet third direction that I want to hint at is the building of intelligent scholarly authoring tools. And I just want to provide a, a quick vision of what might be possible with these tools. Here's an example of an excerpt from a paper that, uh, that my co-author Fred Homan wrote where you can see that one of the really beautiful things about this paper is that he colorized each of the symbols within the equation and then colorized each of the descriptions of it within the surrounding text. This is something that has a lot of visual pop and also helps someone find the relevant information about that equation in the surrounding text. What would an interactive system look like for building, uh, for, for building more effective explanations like this? Well, and one could imagine extensions to conventional writing, uh, writing, writing environments that, for instance, detect instances of notation, detect potential explanations of that notation using some of the techniques that we're already building out, and allow someone to link those two together. And once you've done this for enough of the notation, you not only could provide something like these colorized versions of the passages, but you also have enough information to automatically lay out these equation diagrams, or at least to use the author in order to help disambiguate how these equation diagrams should look. And in fact, there's this huge wide space of ways that you can help someone uh, pre present uh, material really effectively within research papers, that if you just look at some of the experiments that people are conducting in new forms of scientific documents, in online videos, as well as blogs, there might be things that we would want to unlock for scholarly documents as well. For instance, the use of graphical expressions within their text and formula diagrams which of these can an intelligent tool assist with in the visual presentation as well as determining what are the appropriate kind of dimensions for explaining this notation? Furthermore, acknowledging the fact that notation 
uh, is, is common in math papers, but what is even more common is tables and charts across the hundreds of millions of papers that are out there. How can we use some techniques from natural language processing to plug into the authoring experience to help authors, for instance, check is the data consistent with the textual descriptions of it? How many significant digits are even conventional to show with my field? Or figuring out if a figure is uh, adequately summarized by, by a caption for, for a chart that appears within the paper. This, among many other ideas, I think represent the frontier of ways that we can build out intelligent scholarly authoring tools by continually, by, by really understanding what the authoring task looks like, what author's goals are, and how we can meet somewhere in the middle between the author's goals and the models and, and text processing techniques that are available. As I look forward in my research, I see you know, one of the main goals is not only exploring how to develop these techniques for scientific papers, but for many other types of both scholarly documents and other types of uh, other types of documents in which ideas are expressed from digital textbooks to Wikipedia articles to public policy briefings, maybe even orchestral scores and TED talks someday. And I think that we will be able to do that as long as we continue to pay attention to the way that these tasks of cleaning and editing and explaining manifest within each of these documents and the ways that we can leverage the abstractions within them to support sophisticated interactive reading and authoring. So uh, thanks for your attention. And with that, I'd like to welcome questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, feel free to speak up if you have any questions. I, uh, a question, I have a question around kind of the authoring experience and do you kind of foresee any shift away from LaTeX, um, towards maybe other formats like HTML for actually typesetting too, or is that unlikely? I think, I think we're slowly crawling in that direction. For instance, uh, a lot of ACM conferences have started using a system called TAPS, which automatically converts LaTeX into HTML. And the main intention is thinking that in the future, maybe five or 10 years down the road, maybe we'll all be reading these papers as HTML instead of as these PDFs. So, you know, I could imagine that if eventually we all end up using uh, you know, media like HTML in order to read papers, then we'll no longer have a reason to depend on things like LaTeX. So I, I think that it is uh, expedient of us to assume that like, you know, to at the same time as trying to meet people where they are to try to plug into existing processes, also try to think about, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, might people be using other types of markup languages or even direct manipulation tools for, uh, you know, for, for producing their scientific texts and all of the beautiful notation in them. Um, Andrew, I had a question. Um sort of inspired by your, the second project you presented uh, for cleaning. Um, while you're presenting that, it kind of got me thinking since everyone's doing this UNLP thing, it's like the process of cleaning co these um, notebooks is really similar to how we've been cleaning our Overleaf projects, um, like reorganizing everything. And I'm wondering what sort of tools or software or like requirements needed to exist for you to be able to work on that project like if we wanted to do something like that today say for overleaf could we even do it like how would we i'm kind of curious like what made it possible for you to work on that project um so we can kind of see if it's even possible now for overleaf yeah uh that's a great question in fact there's this um there's, there's this one slide that i that i can share here which is um i I, I think um, I, I think it's really fascinating to think about what are assistive cleaning tools that we could provide to scholars to help them both kind of clean up their prose as well as to kind of clean up the organization too. So you can imagine like a first stage where you help people um, you you help people tighten their arguments, and then a second stage where maybe they combine all of this stuff into a single tech file and get rid of the unnecessary figures. I think in both of these cases, the requirements are. Uh, similar in that you need some notion of what a dependency is. Uh, so, you know, when someone selects certain content that is worth keeping, what is the other content that is very necessary to keep that around? Um, I think that, you know, if you're, 
If you're also considering the realm of transforming the text, then you also have to have some model of how to simplify that text. So that will be essentially semantically equivalent, which in the case of code scope, we had in, in the case of you know, dynamically instrumenting the code and understanding the values that each of the expressions took on over time. I don't entirely know what the modules are that would end up detecting those dependencies in semantic equivalence, but I do know that the people on the Semantic Scholar research team would probably have much better ideas about what those components might be, and I think it is a really interesting frontier for research. Thanks. Andrew, um, nice, really nice talk. I, I was wondering, you mentioned about interactivity in terms of supporting authors to try to improve the papers. I, I was wondering if you thought any, anything about um, interactivity with readers. Uh, like, for example, one reason why I'm sometimes hesitant to help uh, to, to use these kinds of supports is because I don't know if it's um, gonna actually help me. And, and so there are some mistakes. And uh, have you thought about how, how users could help other users um, to consume the, the paper better? Yeah, absolutely. So, um... I guess I can answer your question with, with an example, which is there's this uh, Chrome plugin, which is called Fermat's Library. And the purpose of Fermat's Library is that it provides, uh, it, every time that someone opens up uh, a PDF, it ends up overlaying on top of that PDF annotations that have come from other community members who also have Fermat's Library. So for instance, your instructor for your course can go through and talk about some of the historical precedent for some of the ideas within the paper. And someone else can ask a question about what might be confusing within the paper, and someone else can come in and answer that question. Um, you know, I think the problem, so I think that that provides a, a, a potential template for the way in which readers can help scaffold other readers in understanding the paper. One of the biggest challenges with uh, with this, I think, is the, is the, is, is the problem of acquiring enough data for it to be useful. And that you imagine that there's like hundreds of millions of papers out there. You know, who knows which of those papers are actually getting more than like a dozen readers in any particular year. You need to have a certain critical mass around these papers for you to be able to get these community cultivated explanations. So um, I, um, I, think that, I think that it is a really interesting idea. I think that people could provide a lot of uh, helpful scaffolding for each other in annotating these papers. I think that there might be an interesting research project to be done in designing incentive structures around getting people to provide those effective annotations to help guide other people through those papers. Um, any other questions? Um, since we're right at the hour, um, why don't we all thank Andrew again for really a fantastic talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.